vein occlusion is super common. So you'll see, you're going to see a lot of vein occlusion. So you really need to know how to diagnose and manage vein occlusions. So we're going to do branch vein and central vein, which are always, they're total, I think they're, they're very different. They're not totally different, I guess. They're often on the same handout, like the academy handouts have branch vein and central vein on them. You have to cross out, but they're different disease. So retinal vein occlusion is associated with cardiovascular disease, smoking, advanced stage glaucoma. Excuse me. It's not associated with diabetes. And you monitor for neovascularization and rubiosis. So one way to remember that, because again, I think this would be a great test question. One way to remember it's associated with glaucoma is just to picture the nerve and all the vessels trying to get in there. So this is a glaucomatous nerve, and you can see the vessels are all kind of trying to squeeze over that hill. And so glaucoma is associated with vein occlusion. It's because if I, I'm sure that's going to show up on your quiz at some point. I've heard that the retinopathy that get, you get with high IOP spikes at, at uh, um, vessel occlusions, uh, as opposed to just mechanical pressing on the nerve, like if your pressure goes to 60 for a while. You, it, oh, vein occlusions? Yeah. Are you, mm, you doing anything about that? Not necessarily. I don't know that I've seen that. Okay. With the spikes. I think it's more the anatomy. I think it just gets to be so hard to get over that hump that eventually the vessel occludes. Or, the, or there's a, it's just the flow there is irregular. I thought the high, so like, a high IOP does like stasis or something, or did I just make that up of the, of the traveling blood? Like if you have angle closure, pressure. Well, you can have an artery occlusion. I mean, gosh, I, yeah, I've had that. But um, you have the pressure spikes. I mean, that's a post-op pressure spike. You get a post-op pressure spike, and you get an artery occlusion that they won't see after that. So you can get an artery occlusion, but as far as venous, I don't know if you would get that. Okay. But you could. Um, and then for all, so branch vein occlusion is a blockage at the AV crossing, and the collaterals go across the horizontal rafe. Central vein occlusion is a blockage at the nerve, and the collaterals end up going all the way through to the vortex veins, which you just need to know the anatomy. So you get an optociliary shunt. It goes through to the choroidal vessels and out the vortex veins. And if you, it's nice to be able to explain things to patients in a way that they can understand them. So what I say when I'm talking to patients with vein occlusions is the eye is the, the, eye is the only place in the body where the vessels lie on top of each other. It's just a weird anatomy on the retina, the retinal surface. Every place else the vessels have more room. The retinal surface are all bunched on top of each other. So as your arteries harden, your veins stay soft, and you can kind of push on a vein, say the veins stay soft, and where the artery crosses the vein, it blocks it. But over time, just like if you block a river and the water finds its way around, if you block a vein, the body opens up collateral circulation. So your body will heal a vein occlusion. The central vein has to do with that little canal, and I don't believe it's known yet if it's a little bit of narrowing of the canal or hardening of the artery. But either the canal narrows a little or the artery hardens a little, in either way, there's less room for the vein, and then it occludes. And then one thing you should just know for your head, I didn't put it in here, is when a vessel is occluded, in a very short time, that occlusion turns into a fibrotic plaque, it built in a vein, and you can't really reopen it. So there have been, this is super controversial, but there have been all these things people have done to try to reopen veins, some of which I've done, and they just <laughs> don't work. So there was a time when we would actually try to dissect open the adventitial sheath between a artery and a nerve surgically with big instruments and um, it just doesn't work. And, and the other thing was opening up the canal for um, the central vein, which also didn't work. So I have a, we see this like it wasn't hard for me to get cases. This is an 82 year old woman who had some blood in her left better eye. Her right eye's got wet AMD and her left eye's 20 is asymptomatic, but there was blood. She's not a diabetic and this was all she had. So if you look at that picture, there's a couple spots of blood but they're in the same area. So if you see someone where there's any pathology in part of the retina, what you want to do is say, okay, is that it respects the horizontal midline, and there are a couple spots, I don't know, like eight spots of blood, superior, you know, and they also are around one of the veins, kind of. So it's probably a branch vein occlusion. And it's, it, they can be very subtle. So this, you know, is this wet AMD or hypertensive? It could be, but you know, there's nothing below. There's nothing really in the center. It's all in that one area. So when you're trying to figure out a branch vein, you, unless there's a vein, 
and they're in one region is not a branch vein, but if there is, it probably is. And this is what happens with codes. You're trying to figure out, do they have codes? So you're looking in one area, say, is it one vein or not? And if it is, it's probably a branch vein. I got the floor seems, it looks like this, which is not much, but there is that little hot spot um, just above the nerve, this point here doesn't work, um, which is pro you know, near a crossing, and those little spots superiorly darken. And there's nothing else, so it's probably a vein inclusion. So again, you just leave her, but you see her back. It's like your cotton wool spot patients or your serous detachments. You don't let her go. You see her back. And then this is what she looked like six weeks later. So she's now it's like, oh, yeah, that's a vein inclusion. <clears throat> and she's still good, though. You know, you don't treat her. It's her better eye, but you watch her a little bit. This could convert into a, something that needs treatment. But at vein, at branch vein inclusions, and that was her before and after. So branch vein occlusions, if you see anything that's in one little area of vein, that's probably a branch vein occlusion. And then the other thing is later on, that was an acute one, but this person I had one ages ago. This is one of your patients too. This is someone who went in, and this was again the better eye. The other eye was bad in this patient. I think the other eye might have been NLP in this patient. And this had this funny looking vessel there, but if you look at it, it's a venous venous collateral that's probably been there for a while. So if you look, you can see the blockage here. So the blood can't go there, so it's going this way, and it's going that way. So it's just a little venous venous collateral from a vein occlusion. So there are AV crossings or possibly focal venous inflammation. I've heard this talked about at meetings, and there's some question, are there inflammatory vein occlusions? When you see this hot spot like that, some people think it might be inflammatory, which could be a slightly different differential, but I don't think that's been run with. Um, the prognosis depends on um, how much ischemia there is. So more than five dyscaries in the posterior pole, 36% will develop NV, and 60 to 90% develop uh, vitreous hemorrhage. Again, these numbers are all from, your, from the textbook, so this is all stuff that is considered important for you. So the five dyscarias is before all the wide angle stuff. <clears throat> so if you're looking for five dyscarias, don't look way on the periphery. This is a patient who had an ischemic, heavy central vein occlusion. Heavy central vein occlusions are considered branch vein occlusions, for just your information. So if you're looking at studies, um, and there's, that's all non-perfused on the bottom. So this person's at a very high risk of neovascularization, and there may even be some on the nerve there already. But Steve, branch vein occlusions, how often do they get neo? I mean, I thought I always thought of the. I vein think it's very rare. Central. According to the branch vein occlusion study, 36 percent of the patients with greater than five dyscaries had neovascularization. Okay. I can tell you in my career, I've seen fewer than five patients with branch vein and neovascularization. So I don't know if I'm just not seeing these patients or what the numbers are. But. And then you can lose vision from branch vein occlusion. So uh, subretinal fibrosis, epiretinal membrane, macular ischemia, edemia can cause vision loss. That's why we do like to suppress edema. Lipid in the phobia is like, ugh, I hate that. And then tractional RD. Sometimes you'll see someone comes in with decent vision, 2040, bunch of lipid in the fovea, and as you dry out the retina, that's just gonna build up. Um, this is a patient who saw me with uh, June of 2017 with 3200 vision, real bad edema. Also, you can see the retina is just disrupted like terror. This was a vein occlusion patient. And then we dried it out, and her vision, the vision got no better. And that's this entity um, drill, disorganization of the retinal inner layers. So even though the, there's no macular edema, the outer retina looks decent. The, the, you can see the chart of that eye. So real bad edema can cause you to lose vision. Laser for BRBO, we don't really do anymore. It was one of the least effective of all the lasers, but it does work, and you delay for three months. If there's an intact foveal vasculature, the vision's reasonable. 65% of patients gain two lines with laser versus 37% without laser. And in three years, 60% um, or 2040 or better got treated. Again, I'm just, this is right, this is stuff that you might still get tested on. And then scatter PRP, you treat the area of the neovascularization. So this was a woman who came in, a 62-year-old patient, who had a vein occlusion years ago. And that's what you'll see sometimes. Someone had a vein occlusion years ago, and she's got a vitreous hemorrhage. And this is what she looks like. She's got the sort of boat-shaped hemorrhage on the bottom. You can see the ischemia supratemporally. And then when you get up there, she's got that area of neovascularization. And she has had laser, but there's non-perfused retina that's not been treated. So in a vein occlusion, unlike a... In a branch vein occlusion, unlike a, I guess you can do this in diabetics, you can actually map your laser with the fluorescein. 
So you do the fluorescein, look for the non-perfusion, and treat the non-perfusion, and that should suppress the ischemia. I think you probably need to treat a little bit outside the non-perfusion, too. <clears throat> so I, I, she, she had laser on the periphery, but it wasn't adequate. So I lasered her more, and um, that was her over visits. And like we talked about in the, before, is the neovascularization won't go away, it'll shrink. Excuse me. So basically, with laser, you can make neovascularization shrink up and less likely to bleed. So that's branch vein. And then, oh, that's not everything, though, because we do, well, do medication therapy after. Central vein, dilated veins and all per quadrant, retinal hemorrhage, and they, and they always have optic disc edema. So that's, again, that's something just to know. So if, you, if you're worried, because sometimes people will be sent in. Um, one thing I get a lot of times is ischemic optic neuropathy, and people want to know if it's a vein occlusion. And really, there's, for a vein occlusion, you have to have hemorrhage pretty far out. And usually, ischemic optic neuropathy is just around the nerve. They can have a lot of hemorrhage or a little hemorrhage, and it depends on how they do. This is more likely ischemic. This is less likely ischemic. And then there's non-ischemic and ischemic central vein occlusions, and then there are ones that are intermediate. So non-ischemic or perfused, there's good vision. There's usually no APD or a mild APD. And ischemic have a lot of non-perfusion, at least 10 disc areas. And again, this is mostly a posterior pole. Uh, fluorescein and they'll have an APD and poor vision and they'll sometimes have convol spots and in the central vein occlusion ischemic only 10% did 2400 or better whereas not ischemic do pretty well <coughs> so it's a big difference whether they're ischemic and some of them will convert if they're in between they mostly convert to ischemic so again iris neovascularization and again this is out of the basic academy book they had a thing called very ischemic central vein occlusion which wasn't defined so if you have a very ischemic central vein occlusion, if someone asks you what's the chance of neovascularization in a very ischemic central vein occlusion, it's about 60%. And it's usually within three to five months of onset. And poor visual acuity and non-perfusion in blood are risk factors for neovascularization if you have a very ischemic central vein occlusion. The reason I'm showing this is this, is, this shows you iris neovascularization. Um, I'll show you in a minute, though. And you, you need to, well, we'll talk about follow-up. And then causes, if they're greater than 50, the workup is unnecessary. You worry about oral contraceptives in, in younger, in females, I guess anybody taking them. Diuretics in a hypercoagulable state, if someone's got um, um, sluggish blood, like hyperhomocysteinemia, protein, S protein C, and vasculitis, sarcoid, or lupus. I list these three things, again, but just based on the book. Because there's, there's a million things you worry about in central vein occlusion. Somehow they, the authors chose these three. So if you look at hyperhomocysteinemia, protein C, protein S, and, and sarcoid. Um, if you look outside of our literature, at risk for thromboembolism, most people look at the genetic testing nowadays in 2018. So factor V lytin and prothiamine gene. If you look at protein S, if major risks of, of venous thromboembolism, there's protein S, protein C, antithrombin, deficiency, factor V, prothrombin, and then if you have compound that, you're like really high risk. And then differential diagnosis for vein occlusion, you got the hyperviscosity. So if you have, if both eyes are looking sluggish and, and occluded, then you got to really look for dysproteinemias, like the gammopathies, and, and you can look at protein electrophesis, and you can, you can look at blood viscosity and CVCs. <clears throat> So then I was diving into thrombophilia testing. And it's a controversial, and this is something that I'm 25 years in practice, and this has all been evolving while I've been in practice. And that's why I kind of like doing these lectures, because it gives me a reason to sit down and read forever about all these topics. And um, apparently, it's not necessary. Apparently, most fields feel that thrombophilia testing is a complete waste of time. So we do it on people who are younger, and some people do it on all patients. Like, I've seen patients presented with branch vein occlusions or someone did testing. You know, I never would do that, but central vein I would test if they were younger, but the thing is, if you look at studies that have been done for um, venous thrombosis, there's been no demonstrated outcome in any study where modifying your anticoagulation had any benefit for the patient or that the testing had benefit for the patients. So the only things that they talk about with the thrombophilia testing is if there's a first degree relative who wants to use contraceptive of one of your patients who has a protein S deficiency, you might want to say, watch out for the contraceptives. You know, estrogen contraceptives might be a bad idea. So that, so that was interesting. I didn't know that. 
Um, so there's no validated recommendations on and thrombophilia testing for DVT. Go ahead. You're saying there's no benefit of anticoagulation just in these retinal vein occlusions, right? Yeah, nobody, don't anticoagulate retinal vein occlusions. That's not. And, and the thinking is just that like the emboli would be so small that it wouldn't do anything? Because you think of like a Yeah, it's fully formed. It's not so much the size. Because you're not looking at, at, uh, at uh, you know, are you talking about... Um, but like if someone has a DVT in the leg, right, they can yeah. put on anticoagulation. Ostensibly, it's going to go to the lung or something. Right, try to keep it from going. Yeah. Yeah, well, these aren't going to go anywhere. But also, they're, the idea is that you're not going to open the vessel because the thought is the vessel's fibros close very quickly. Maybe because they are so small. Okay. Probably because the ones in the leg are bigger and you can't fibrose that big a vessel so quickly. Okay. But, the, you know, Hay Ray's a big, you read him, he gets angry, like, he'll be angry. I've never seen him be, but in the reading, like, he looks like he's angry when he reads papers about these things. And they say that with, you know, all the studies suggest when you block a central vein or branch vein within, you know, a day or minutes or a very short period of time, that's permanently closed. Okay. You know, it's almost like, so, so, you, so it doesn't help to anticoagulate. So when you're doing a CRBO applicate evaluation, you want to do visual acuity, APD, fluorescein, and you can look at ERG and visual field. APD is a big one. So if you're trying to judge, if you looked at the inclusion criteria for some of the central vein inclusion studies, they used APD. So if you're, rather than looking at areas of um, ischemia, and APD can be a big one, that this drove me crazy. They looked at, I think it was considered a brisk APD. Is this still recording? Tell me if it shuts off, would you? I bet it'll restart. I feel like I've been talking forever. Yeah, I'll stop and start it again. Well, the APD is important. <clears throat> and then the other thing is, um, if someone's got declining vision with a central vein occlusion, the chances are they're going from non-ischemic to ischemic. 16% in the central vein occlusion went from non-ischemic to ischemic at four months and 34% at 36 months. So the central vein occlusion study, the thing everybody learned from that is really if you have someone's central vein occlusion, you got to do monthly exams, okay, I don't know, monthly exams for six months undilated with gonioscopy, which is a pain in the neck. I hate doing gonioscopy. <laughs> but I have them in my, I have those little, the little... Uh, Zeiss. Yeah, the Zeiss ones, thank you. So you don't have to go up the retina. And you really should do, because in this patient, there's neovascularization of the angle, which you would never see unless you did gonioscopy. And it's florid. You know? So you're so you really need to look in the angle, look all the way around. If they're starting to get neovascularization of the angle, you need to do PRP on the central vein, or at least start them on shots. Surgical management, um, macular laser does not work for central vein occlusion. That's something you could be tested. I don't think it'd be fair, but Macular laser works for branch vein, not for central vein. PRP, you don't do prophylactic, you do it just for neovas, if there's rubiosis. So if there's NVI or NVA, you do PRP. You're not supposed to do prophylactic PRP for non-perfusion. You do vitrectomy for vitreous hemorrhage. <coughs> Abandoned surgeries are peripheral laser anastomosis, again, it's right out of the textbook. Peripheral anastomosis, relaxing radial optic neuropathy, and retinal vein cannulation with infusion of TPA. Yeah. That's a Florida thing. So many things that are kind of weird were done in Florida. There's a guy in central Florida who was trying to sell this thing. And, um, but I have to say, having said that's abandoned, oh, I don't, do I have a slide in here? Okay, so this is a patient of mine. This is a patient who had, um, it was, she was referred, this, I get, this is getting late. Anyway, she had a vitreous hemorrhage and rubiosis in this eye. And it was a, she had, um, Neovascular glaucoma. She was she was one month out from cataract surgery. She'd had a long history of a vein occlusion. She thought it was 50 years. And she had neovascular glaucoma with a vitreous hemorrhage. And I treated her with Avastin. I put her on pressure lowering meds. The blood wasn't clearing. The pressure wasn't coming down. And I did a vitrectomy with an Ahmed valve. I was going to show you the video, but I don't know if this, this is likely not going to play. And I don't know if we want to watch a surgical video. Do you want to watch a surgical yeah, video? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Just take a minute. Um, I'll find it. It's in this folder. So you put it on that album? Yeah. I'll tell your boss that <laughs> I did that. Um, I train where I trained. We did. Uh, we would do vitrectomy omits for uh, for uh, neovascular glaucoma. This is Dr. Stephen Cohen, and this video shows surgery for a patient with neovascular glaucoma. She All right, was, so this is surgery for neovascular glaucoma. So basically, the first thing you do is put the valve plate on. So you just open it. And I have to tell you, before doing anything that can be construed as non-retina, check with your ophthalmologist, because you don't want to do something they're going to do. None of my referring ophthalmologists have any interest in on valves. 
And um, so anyway, so you suture it, put it eight millimeters back with eight on nylon. I used to use five on nylon, but I switched to eight on. Also supero-temporal, not supero-nasal. When you first started doing these, they were supero-nasal. You're very gentle with the plate. If you crush the plate, it's bad, it's bad. It grows fibrosis. So I try not to touch it, I hope. And then you just tie it in, and then you leave it. I mean, that does, that's 10 minutes probably, 15 minutes maybe. And then you do your vitrectomy. Um, Vitreous hemorrhage vitrectomies are very stressful because you can't see what's going on. So you go very slow. So this is super edited. And then I still couldn't see, so I washed out the anterior chamber. She had a little bit of blood. It's hard to tell at the time of surgery, but keeping your view clear is a big thing in surgery. So then I washed. Then I could see. So now you can see pretty well in the back. And then I cleaned her out. And she had the vein occlusion, so I, feel, I did a full PRP on her. <coughs> and, um, and then, what did I do? That. I don't know. Oh, and then I did a vitrectomy right where the valve was going to go in, and I trimmed it, and then I primed it, and then I put it in. And, um, and basically, it's about a 22 gauge track for the, and the nice thing with these is, see, it goes posterior. So you don't need to put it in the anterior chamber if we do it, if the retina guy does it. So it's not near anything. So I just, I do a little extra vitrectomy where it's going to go in with scleral depression, and then I try to do a complete vitrectomy posteriorly, and then I just tuck it in, prime it. Uh, it's, Where's the tip? Sitting. The tips, you know, outside, uh, the, by the pars plana, yeah. somewhere. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you can't see. You length, you know, you, it's pretty forgiving the length, but you got to make sure you do a decent vitrectomy up there. Mm -hmm. And then there's no the cornea, the angle, like none of it matters because you're posterior. And then you just tuck it in, and then you pull your things out. When I first started doing these, I tried to make my sclerotomies where I was going to do them, but it's not worth the effort now. These things self seal so quick. You pressurize the IVM with a little bit of air. She did really, this lady was, she was hand motion beginning, and then she was, her pressure's been eight for six months on no meds. You said you pressurize it with air? Yeah, at the end of the vitrectomy, you check, check some air in. We do that on many, if the pressure's low, it tends to seal the sclerotomies. And, um, where was I? Sears the sclerotomies, and, and um, it probably also protects the eye a little bit from vitreous attaching to your sclerotomies. Because um, that's when, when you see like the one month post retinal detachments, um, it's probably there. It's probably the vitreous wicking up to a sclerotomy. So if you put a little air in, and for a while we put on everybody putting a little air in at the end of the vitrectomy to try to isolate the sclerotomies. But now we just do it to pressurize the eye. If you pressurize with BSS, it doesn't push them close to it as well. Um, and this was that lady, and she looked pretty, she was a very nice lady. And she had a weird configuration, though. She was a, she was like a, you can't really call it anything. She had one vein that was open. So she was like a hemicentral vein and then an inferonasal vein occlusion. And then she had this vein open, but she was 2160. So it wasn't a dead eye. If that's the thing about when there's a vitreous hemorrhage and neovascular coma, and there's a, a hand motion or light perception vision, that may have salvageable vision. And the best way to salvage it, I think, is do a vitrectomy and stick a valve in, do laser. So we do that. Um, and that's what she looked like. So that's the surgery for vein occlusions. And then, um, oh, and then the cardiac, this paper came out last month in, uh, in JAMA Ophthalmology, which I think is one of our better journals. It used to be considered the best one. I don't know, ophthalmology might be the best one now. So this is 58 patients. Uh, half the patients had, a, a, all the patients got Lucentis. Half got laser for coronary anastomosis, half didn't. And the half that did had better visions. They were 20, 40, and fewer injections. So it was 3.2 injections in the laser group versus 7.1 in the non-laser group after the initial load. But there were problems in the late coronary anastomosis with traction of vitreous hemorrhage. Um, so this is a patient I did years ago. She was an 84-year-old lady with central vein occlusion. This was before anti-VEGF. So I did it with Kenalog, and then I did the coronavirus and now they look like... Excuse me. So if you're going to do this, you laser a vein in the periphery really hot, and you want to try to get a choroidal hemorrhage at the site, or try to get a vitri try to get the vein to bleed where you're lasering it. And you try to do it near a choroidal vessel. I think that published a case report once, but I think that was important. And you try to go where a retinal vein overlaps a choroidal vessel and then just burn the out of it. Try to nick the vein and try to do it in people who already had a PVD and avoid diabetics. It's because it seems like if they don't have a PVD, you're going to get the fibrosis and the diabetics can get some nasty vascularization. But the, and then you can tell it's working if the vein, uh, if the vein 
here, if this is narrow, that means that blood's going that way. Does that make sense? So if you get some closing of the vein there, you can tell they're working. So I like it. I, now I have to say, I don't know if I can do it with my newer lasers. The older lasers used to go up to two or three watts, but the new lasers only go up to about 750 milliwatts or 900, and I don't know if you can pop it with that. Okay, and then pharmacological for our VO, this is a lot. But I'll try, I'm gonna go quickly just because it's getting late. And um, you know all the anti-VEGFs work. They give you similar results in the intravitreal corticosteroids work. And again, systemic anticoagulation is not recommended per the textbook for this. Um, there's the Bravo and the Cruz study. These are the only two I can remember because Bravo is branch retinal vein and Cruz is central retinal vein in the beginning with the central vein. And that was for Lucentis and they had about 50% of the patients gain letters. And then there was a FLIBRCEP study showing they were good and there were good studies for Bevacizumab. And this was a patient I just saw. I actually don't have any of these on my website, but it was a one-year guy came in for follow-up. He was 5200 initially. He actually wouldn't have been included in the study. But he was ischemic, he had a horrible that vein occlusion. But then, uh, that's what his macula looked like. It was all hemorrhagic and swollen, and just like, ugh. And um, I don't know if that's a lot of non-perfusion, though. I think it is. And then when you look at them a month later, it's dry as a bone. So central vein occlusions, within, you know, you shoot them within a week or two, they dry up. And his vision did great. He did 5200 to 2160, ultimately to 2080. And this is why in your charts, it's nice to note the initial pre-treatment vision and central thickness. So what I do with my patients, if I'm treating for central vein or wet AMD, I put, you know, treatment in, next to the diagnosis, treatment initiated, here was the central vision. Because this patient still aggravated he's seen in 2080, you know, even though he started at 5200, but that's good. So you have to tell him, that's good. You couldn't see the chart when you came in. Um, these are the curves from the branch vein inclusion study. You know, the patients treated did better. Although actually the patients not treated do okay with branch vein occlusion. Central vein occlusion, they don't do well in treated, but with treatment they gain three lines. And then the other thing that's important to note now, those curves came out, what we would tell people is you need six months of treatment. This was whatever that was, <coughs> 2010, years ago, I guess. And then, um, but then what came out was no, it's not six months of treatment. So for the, the retained study, which was 48 months of following people and trying to figure out how they were doing because the treatment became variable after the first year or two, it seems that if you're maintaining decent vision, 50% of patients um, were doing well after four years of branch vein and 44%, oh, off treatment and doing well. So with branch vein, so what I tell my patients now, they go, how many of these shots am I gonna need? For branch vein, there's about half the patients who will need less than four years of treatment, but the other half are gonna need more than four years. And for central vein, it's about 44% that can get away with less than four years and about 60% that need it for more than four years. So it's not a short-term thing for vein occlusion. And it's nice to get that out. And then corticosteroids. Um, so the SCORE trial was the um, intravitreal triamcinolone, and then Geneva was the Ozerdex study. And the Ozerdex study was kind of weird because um, um, they were shooting for a six-month duration, and they didn't get that. They were really more of a three-month treatment. So if you're doing Ozerdex, I think does work well for diabetics and vein occlusion, but I do it every two or three months. It doesn't work at six months. This was a really stressful patient. It's a 38-year-old woman who came in. Decreased vision for four days in her only eye. Her left eye had been enucleated for retinal blastoma. She's three months pregnant and has a history of prior miscarriages, and she's got a central vein occlusion, and um, and she's got macular edema. So, <laughs> like, what are you going to do? So anyway, so I actually did. Even though she was fake, I did an Ozerdex in her, and uh, and she got tested. I see. I, that's why I've been sending people out to hematologists. I, as I'm getting older, I you guys are fresh out of training. You kind of. Thing. But things change over time, and I was worried about the testing, so the hematologist did all this stuff on her, which again, I'm not sure you should do that. She came out with to be homozygous for MTHFR, which apparently is one of the most common mutations that gives you hyperhomocystinemia, but it turns out it doesn't really matter. Again, so that's where those, those DBT studies were saying, you can do all this testing, whatever you find, doesn't really matter. You don't anticoagulate them. You anticoagulate based on their symptoms, not the testing. But she did well. So this was her, she got an Ozerdex. Her vision went from 2030 to 2016 in a week. And uh, she didn't really get, it was just one treatment. And then she cleared and she didn't need anything else. 
All right, so a few questions we're gonna finish before 10. Which is not a risk factor for retinal vein occlusion? Oh, good, nice job. Okay, diabetes, good. That's hard, I think that's, a, I, if I were doing tests, I would put that one on, diabetes, say I did that animation. And then, uh, what is not a cause of permanent vision loss in, di in central vein occlusion? In vein, any vein occlusion? Okay, I, <laughs> I couldn't think of one. So lipid, and then this is, I think, what is a risk factor for visual acuity? Yeah, yeah, visual acuity. Poor visual. Yeah, the other ones are not a risk factor. Good, poor visual acuity. All right. Um, so remember, branch in summary: branch retinal vein occlusion, blockage in AV crossing. The patients are going to build up collaterals. If there's greater than five disc areas of non-perfusion, it's considered ischemic, and they have a risk of NVI. And anti-VEGFs are standard of care for everything. But steroids do work. And then for central vein, ischemic is greater than 10 disc areas. So someone's asking, branch is five, central's 10, APD, poor vision, macular edema can be treated with steroids or anti vegetables but not laser. And you treat rubiosis with PRP. And if they're coming with a vein inclusion, you've got to follow them monthly for six months. That's it. Mark, yeah. question. Um, what's the contraindication with, with anti vegetables in pregnancy? Yeah. Oh, the fetus. Baby yeah, you got the fetus in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we know that, or we're just we're just no, we don't know it. that. Okay, no, and that's yeah. a that's a. <laughs> 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 <laughs>